All right. Well, welcome everyone. Um, thank you for joining the joining the Greenwich Historical Society uh, lecture by Keith Stokes uh, on God's Little Acre. Um, I'm Deborah Mecki. I'm the executive director and CEO of the Historical Society, which is headquartered in Cost Cobb, Connecticut, where it is our mission to preserve and interpret the history of Greenwich, Connecticut, and to do this to strengthen the community's connection to our past, to each other, and to our future. Tonight's program is part of a series um, the Historical Society's Education Committee and staff have organized for the spring of 2021 leading up to Preservation Month, which is in May. These programs focus on how local African heritage and history can be reclaimed and interpreted for today's audiences. As we said, we begin with Keith Stokes. His presentation will be on his research and interpretation of Newport's oldest and largest existing enslaved and African-American burying ground in America, known as God's Little Acre. Really an astonishing fact. Um, and I know you're gonna learn a lot more about Keith's work. His projects are very diverse and the impact and things that are happening are so exciting to learn about. We're gonna return in April with a lecture by Teresa Vega on her work to research African-American history and of uh, Hang Root, a section of Greenwich and the Byram Cemetery. Her talk will take place on April 20th. In May, we hold our first Witness Stones installation ceremony at Bush Holly House. This project is the culmination of two years of research projects by students from Greenwich schools on four of these enslaved residents of the Bush household. We hope you will join us for this free community event on May 27th. Now to find out more about our programs or to register for them, you can visit our website, which is GreenwichHistory.org. And there you will also see more information about the uh, fun events happening this spring, including the, including the opening of our next exhibition entitled Beautiful Work, the Art of Greenwich Gardens and Landscapes, or the Lecture on Botanical History by author Martha McDowell, and our first Spring Fet for Families, a live event at the Bush Holly site. So we hope we'll see you in person for uh, that event. And now I turn the program over to Anna Greco. She's the Director of Education at the Historical Society, and she will you know, give you a little bit of background about how to enjoy this program tonight as well as to introduce our distinguished speaker. Thank you, Deborah, and thank you all for joining us this evening. Uh, before we get started, just a few notes about this evening's Zoom format. Uh, we're hosting the event as a webinar, so you will just see the speaker in their presentation. Our speaker, Keith Stokes, is excited about answering questions, and you can submit yours through the Q&A function. So if you're not familiar with this function, at the bottom of the screen, you will see a Q&A option with a speech bubble icon. You just click on this, a window will open and you can submit your questions. You're welcome to submit questions throughout the program and we will address them at the end of the talk. Uh, Mr. Stokes has a long and distinguished career in business and community development. Um, he has degrees from Cornell University and University of Chicago, and he has held positions as the Executive Director of the Rhode Island Economic Development Corporation and Executive Director of the Newport County Chamber of Commerce. He is also a dedicated preservationist. He has been an advisor for Rhode Island with the National Trust for Historic Preservation. He has served as chairman of the Toro Synagogue Foundation, vice president and trustee of the Preservation Society of Newport County and Newport Historical Society. Mr. Stokes is a frequent national, state and local lecturer in community and regional planning. Historic preservation and interpretation with an expertise in early African and Jewish American history. He has been the recipient of numerous local, state, and national awards. Uh, Mr. Stokes is the vice president with the 1696 Heritage Group, um, and the 1696 Heritage Group is a historical consulting firm dedicated to helping persons and institutions of color to increase their knowledge and access to the light and truth of their unique American heritage. Their team has worked on a broad range of projects for public and private clients across the African diaspora, and the organization is based in Newport, Rhode Island. Uh, tonight, Mr. Stokes will discuss one of 1696 Heritage Group's projects, God's Little Acre, American's Colonial African Cemetery. 
This burial ground has been recognized as having possibly the oldest and largest surviving collection of markers of enslaved and free Africans, the earliest of whom were born in the late 1600s. It should be noted that having a burial marker um, at this time was, was an incredible privilege that few could afford. These lasting memorials are often seen as a final resting place, but for tonight's speaker, God's Little Acre is the beginning of Newport's African and African-American history. So please welcome tonight's speaker, Keith Stokes. Thank you, Anna. And it's a great pleasure to be here on behalf of the Greenwich Historical Society. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't give a shout out to my great Facebook friend, Teresa Vega. So happy to be here and happy to be with Teresa and everyone here in Connecticut. Um, this program, I'm gonna to attempt to present about 300 years of history in about 40 minutes. So lots of information. Um, at the end, I will be available to answer any questions you might have. I will leave my email address and please feel free to email me and I'll certainly try to respond to any questions or comments you might have. Uh, this program is gonna be separated into four simple parts. The first part is an introduction of Africa and then later Africans and the transatlantic slave trade and how they would eventually end up in colonial Rhode Island and New England. The second part will talk about the evolution of the burying ground. And most importantly, it'll actually have descriptions of Africans who are carving markers in inscribing on markers and really reflecting on their African identity, both enslaved and free in early Newport. The third part, what's what we're gonna call recovery and restoration and celebration is how we recover this information. How do we source the primary and secondary documents? And then how do we tie it to the cemetery as a part of the interpretation of the cemetery? We'll also talk about restoration, the ongoing restoration act efforts to restore the markers, many that go back close to 300 years and then the third part is celebration. How do we celebrate? How do we interpret it? And we work with historical institutions, artistic institutions, school groups, and the celebration piece we feel is absolutely essential because it creates an opportunity for anyone and everyone to be engaged on this history and celebrate this history. And then the final piece is going to be a short three minute video that will introduce you to the children because many of the Africans that arrived not only in colonial Rhode Island, but colonial New England were under the age of 14. So by the very fact that African children would survive passage from West Africa to the West Indies via the Middle Passage and eventually to the Americas is extraordinary in its own right. And we thought it would be very opportune to be able to provide you a sense of what life was like for African children at that time. So my beginning point of this presentation begins with Africa before European colonization because it's absolutely essential to understand that the African people in the African continent and all of the tribes and countries that are part of that continent existed well before European colonization and settlement. And in fact, these African people had already existed as highly civilized, organized empires. In fact, in the case of West Africa, which is largely associated with New England, there are already in place West African leadership within what is today the Ghana empire, which would have been called the Gold Coast at the time, the Akan empire, Shanti, all of these institutions and organizations were not only highly civilized, they also had in place significant trade skills and trade routes. Many of them were tradesmen in the areas of goldsmith, in the areas of leather making, silversmith, rice cultivation. These were all in place. So what's important to understand is, as the Africans that arrive, particularly to New England, more so New England than the American South and the West Indies and South America, many of them brought with them so much more than their labor. They brought their skilled trades, their religion, their culture, their language, their foodstuffs, and all those things become assimilated in and contributing to building the great communities, the great states in New England and the Americas. And that's an important starting point. The starting point is the African people, not the trade. And in the case of New England, and this is a very well-versed map of the Sanderson, which is a Newport-based brig, and this ship as you can see is leaving Newport carrying rum, which is the chief commodity of trade that is brought to, in this case, the Gold Coast, which is today Ghana. That rum is exchanged for enslaved Africans. Those enslaved Africans are then transported via the Middle Passage to English colonial settlements in the West Indies, such as Barbados and Jamaica. Remember, we are part of the British 13 colonies, so we are trading with other British settlements. Today's Ghana, or the Gold Coast, was a significant British West African settlement. 
Barbados, Jamaica, Antigua, Bahamas, or others. But in the case of New England, particularly places like New London, Connecticut, Boston, Massachusetts, Bristol, Rhode Island, Newport, Rhode Island, it is ships leaving from a New London and a Newport and traveling to the Gold Coast, what is Ghana, and taking on enslaved Africans from places like Elmina Castle, Fort William Castle, Cape Coast Castle, and then transporting those enslaved Africans to the sugar plantations and coffee plantations of Barbados and Jamaica and the West Indies. And then in some cases, some Africans for very specialty work are transported from the West Indies and back to London, back to Boston, back to Newport. So that essentially is what we today call the triangular trade. In Rhode Island's case, we've been able to, through primary record research, document at least 934 voyages, slave voyages between 1705 and 1807. So that 100 year period, we now know in at least Rhode Island's case, out of that 934 voyages, it's Newport, my community of Newport, 672. That represents 72% of the slave voyages at that time are coming from Newport. What's interesting about this documentation is, is that before the American Revolution, Newport is the dominant participant in the transatlantic slave trade. And nearly all of the Newport ships are traveling from Newport to West Africa, to the West Indies and back to Newport. After the American Revolution, with the disruption of the war, Newport ceases to be a sizable, active maritime trade port. And Providence and Bristol Round step forward. And after the American Revolution, Providence and Bristol are now the most active traders in slave, but they're not sending ships necessarily to the West Indies. In fact, we're now finding that after the American Revolution, there's this inter-American trade where ships are leaving places like Bristol, Rhode Island from the DeWolf family, the Brown and Sterry family and Tillinghast of Providence. And they're not going to West Africa, they're going to Havana, Cuba into Puerto Rico. And they're taking enslaved Africans there and transporting them directly to Savannah, Georgia, and to Charleston, South Carolina to work in the rice plantations. So after the American Revolution, when slave trading has been outlawed by the new United States and by the new states such as Massachusetts and Rhode Island, Connecticut, you still have merchants now illegally trading in this intra-trade system. And it runs all the way up until about 1820. This is an important and largely unknown fact of New England's ongoing complicity in African slave trading and ownership. One of the most important aspects of understanding these Africans is to take the time, and I've had the privilege to spend time with the archives in Bahamas, Curaçao, Jamaica, most importantly in Ghana, and be able to extract actual records of the Africans who was captured, where they originated from, and then traveling with ship logs and ship records from Rhode Island ships and Massachusetts ships to the West Indies and eventually back to New England. Fort William at Ananabo. Ananabo is about 30 kilometers north of Accra, the capital city of Ghana, is by far the most active slave fortress for New England merchants and particularly Rhode Island merchants. Uh, Fort William was originally a Dutch fortress and then taken over by the English, and it exists today. In fact, it's about the size of the most famous castle, which is Cape Coast Castle. But at Fort William at Ananabo, that is where Rhode Island merchants are consistently landing and trading. In fact, the trading is hot and heavy during the mid 18th century. We also know that the trading was not simply Rhode Island merchants landing on the African continent and walking into the African inner land and capturing enslaved Africans. In fact, Fort William at Ananabo, that slave castle was set up and led by and managed by Fonte tribal leaders. The Fonte tribal leaders would manage the capture usually partnering with Ashanti tribal leaders and capturing Africans, bringing them to the waterfront, placing them in dungeons within these slave fortresses, and then making them available for the arriving Rhode Island and New England slave merchants. So it's important to recognize that if we're talking about the complicity of the transatlantic slave trade that would bring 12 and a half million African men, women, and children over a three and a half century period from one continent to a new world, you have to understand that that complicity is shared by nearly every religion, every race, and every ethnicity. Some more efficient than others, but nearly everyone was complicit in this. And it's important to recognize that. What's equally important is the fact that we've been able to spend the time working with scholars in Ghana and physically interact with their records and their locations, 
we're now able to reconstruct the varied lives of these Africans even more before enslavement. I can't tell you how important this is because for any of us that have African-American heritage, genealogy can be a challenge, particularly if we're not able to trace ourselves before the second emancipation after the American Civil War. Now we have an opportunity to trace people back, not only with DNA research, but with documentation and connectation where we can now connect people back to their African origins before slavery, before slave trading, and before their arrivals to the Americas. One of the most important traditions that the Africans that arrived, particularly those associated with the Ashanti people, is a tradition that we still see to this day, which is the day naming tradition. If you are born on a day of the week as a boy or girl or your birth order, you're given a day name. My own ancestors, which were taken from Ananabo and brought to Jamaica and then eventually to the Americas, had a name such as Otaba. Otaba means to stay put. And he carried that name over. Later, phonetically, that would be either pronounced or spelled as October. So Octaba became October. If you're a boy born on Monday, your day name is Kojo, K-O-J-O. That phonetically is pronounced in English, Kujo. If you happen to be born on Friday, it's Kofi, such as the late Secretary General of the United Nations was Kofi Amin. We anglicize that to Kofi or Cuff. We have today hundreds and hundreds of day names of African men, women, and children that once lived, worked, worshiped, and eventually died in Newport alone. And when you expand that to New England and into the West Indies, particularly Jamaica, these day names become a very important reconnection to the African origins of the African men, women, and children that arrived here. So now we're placing flesh and blood on the skeletons of the historical past. We're making them real people, something that each and every one of us today can identify with. And again, being a bit of a history nerd and someone of this descent, I can't tell you how exciting it is for me to be able to trace back to the actual African traditions, customs, religions, and languages. Now we're talking about people, not just chattel property. And I want to emphasize this business of slavery because there's been a significant amount written about it, but it's important to recognize that what really drove the slave trade in New England generally, but particularly in urban seaports, of Boston, Providence, Newport, New London, is the rum trade. In fact, New England was the leader in rum production, and it's the rum production that drives the transatlantic trade. It is rum that's being distilled in distilleries across our New England waterfronts. Newport had over two dozen rum distilleries alone during the colonial era, and it's this rum that's sold into European markets, but more importantly, it's used as a single trading commodity for enslaved Africans in the West African coast. Those Africans that are largely captured and transported to the West Indies are working on sugar plantations. And what are sugar plantations doing? They are producing the sugar and the molasses that's being then shipped up in hogshead barrels to colonial seaports in New England and that is distilled into rum. And then that rum is placed on ships and then transported back through the triangular trade to West Africa for more slaves who are then sent to the West Indies as more labor to produce more sugar and more molasses. And again, this cyclic system, this economic system that is driven by molasses and rum is at the very center of the colonial New England slave trade. Remember in New England, we have bad weather and bad soil. There's no cash crops or agricultural based economy that's driving our economies here. You can't have sugar or coffee or tobacco or rice because of our weather and soil. So it's the after products led by rum and then later spermaceti candles and soap making and chocolate grinding, but it's the rum that drives and sustains this industry. This leads to a very important understanding of how the Africans arrived and why they arrived in New England. Since New England didn't have an agricultural based economy, yes, we had farms. We have farms in Connecticut, we have farms in Rhode Island, we have farms in Massachusetts, but they're not large production farms. They're mostly smaller, animal husbandry, uh, corn, some potatoes, self-sufficient. Most of Africans who were enslaved in New England are largely populated in urban seaports because that's where the economy is. That's where the maritime jobs and requirements are. And what we find is, is that during the colonial era, large percentages of the trade workforce are these Africans. And we see them through primary documentation involved in nearly every trade aspect that's required to run and operate and build prosperity in a colonial maritime economy. So again, 
Men are involved in everything from barrel making, they're in mound and snuff making, rum distillers, they're stone maces, they're glass blowers. We have a number of Africans that are trained as chocolate grinders, producing chocolate for the aftermarkets. Women, we find them as household servants, but they are cooks and they are seamstress and sail lofts. They're involved in candle making and other aspects and such. Children, African children, we find them working in rope making. So what's important to understand is the Africans that arrived in New England generally were not being trained or untrained to be large root labor in a sugar plantation. Instead, they're brought in to be apprentice and trained to have access to education, apprentice skills and training skills to work within these industries. So these Africans in New England, they're enslaved, they are chattel property, but because of the economic circumstances of New England, they have access to education, apprenticeship and trade skills, which would have been unnecessary and unheard of and unlawful in the American South or the West Indies. My own ancestors, an eight-year-old boy is brought from Jamaica to Philadelphia to Newport, and he's then placed into indentured service as a Windsor chair maker, and then later as a cabinet maker. And as a young man, as a free young man by 1820, he's got skill sets and technical capabilities and access to education and reading and writing that would have been unheard of for not only most other Africans that are enslaved, but for most newly arriving white immigrants. So it's important to understand that this access to education and training, not because masters and mistresses in New England were more benevolent, but because they had a self-economic interest for this training, would provide a level of access to opportunity for Africans enslaved and later free in New England as compared to the rest or the balance of slavery in the Western Hemisphere. And it's important to recognize this because by the end of the 18th century, in fact, it starts in 1776 on July 4th with the signing of the Declaration of Independence. Over the next several years, starting with Vermont, each of the colonial states as they're now expressing their separation and independence and freedom from Great Britain, they're all now moving towards the abolition of slavery in their own right. Now, but let me be clear, this abolition of slavery is not because of a newfound sense of freedom that they would extend to Africans. It's also a general sense that the economy is changing. The war has disrupted trade. Very few of the ships that are remaining that have not been procured for privateering and other military operations, they're not making it to West Africa. They're not making it to the West Indies. So for the most part, it's the disruption of the economy and the demand for the large number of slave labor and trade labor begins to wean. And as that weans, you now have an abolitionist movement that also puts forth and aggressively asserts the end of slavery. So what we call today the first emancipation, most of us tend to think of emancipation as in 1865 at the end of the Civil War, but the first emancipation is really begins by the end of the American Revolution where you have thousands of Africans in New England and in the North free, but also with access to education and trade skills. This is a very unique circumstance, but also a circumstance would enable these Africans to begin to define themselves as now African-American. And in fact, we have this because we have the primary records. On November 10th, 1780, in my community of Newport, African men came together, all tradesmen. We know this because we have their records in minute books that date from 1780 to about 1830. And they form for the first time in American history, and really world history, a free African Union society. And this Free African Union Society was brought together for three important purposes. One, we are going to organize ourselves and hopefully organize a return to Africa. Secondly, we're going to ensure that every African that is now free in Newport has access to education, training, and if they die, a proper burial. And then the third point is we're going to organize with other free Africans around America or around, at that time, New England. And what we find is, is that by 1780, Newport establishes a free African society, Philadelphia, Boston, and Providence follow suit. We know this because each of the society's records, they're interacting with each other, they're talking, they're exchanging ideas and gifts. In fact, Prince Hall would go on to establish the first African named by him, Prince Hall Masonic unit, is talking with and interacting with fellow Africans in Newport who were in turn contacting Africans in Philadelphia, such as Reverend Absalom Jones, 
who had established the first African Episcopal Church at St. Thomas, and Reverend Richard Allen, who had established the first Mother Bethel African Methodist Episcopal Church. We know this because in the records, they're all talking. In fact, Newport Africans are contacting Richard Allen saying, you're building an African church, we support you, we're sending some money. So what's important here is, is that you've got the first of a organized African benefit political, social, and religious system. And it starts not in the American South, not in New York City, but it starts in places like Newport, Rhode Island and Providence, Rhode Island. What's most exciting about this information is, is every single one of these African societies would evolve into an early African church. And in fact, some of the earliest African churches, free African churches, meaning run by, preached by, organized by the African-American community itself directly evolve from these African societies. And in my town of Newport, the African society would evolve into the Union Colored Congregational Church. My family still owns records from the very beginning who have been members of that church and that congregation. So I just express this to you because it's important to understand that even though these Africans arrived in the worst circumstances, chattel property, because of the unique economic, social, and religious circumstance, they had access to education and training, they had access to organization, they had access to some level of self-sufficiency, late 18th century, early 19th century version of self-sufficiency that gave them the ability to begin building their institutions. The earliest free African schools in America are being established in Boston and in Newport, where African men and women are teaching their own children and raising money for books and supplies. This brings us to the story of the African burying ground. The Gods of the Lakers section of Newport, a one and a half acre section, which is a part of the larger common burying ground, dates back to at least 1705. That's well before the African Benevolent Society was set up in Newport. That's when literally slavery and slave trading was just taking off within the community. But there are Africans arriving and there are Africans that are living, working, and eventually dying. The section that is God's Little Acre is a Northwest section that was set aside initially for not only enslaved Negroes, as we were called at that time, but also paupers and others. But it was never a segregated part of the cemetery. In fact, let me just step back. The difference between a burying ground and a cemetery. A burying ground is exactly that. It's a place where you bury the dead. A cemetery is a 19th century version where you start to introduce landscaping and ornamental monuments and pathways and benches and such. Burying grounds were simple. They were simply a place to be buried. They normally were on the outskirts of town and very rarely were they common. In fact, Newport is one of the earliest and one of the few common burying grounds where all people could be buried. If you had died in the 18th century, you normally would be buried in your parish or your religious affiliation burying ground or your family burying ground. And if you were of no means or little means or a pauper, you tended to be buried in large group places and pauper cemeteries that usually were lost to antiquity within generations. The fact that Newport had one of the earliest common burying grounds where everyone agreed that everyone would be equally buried there, including enslaved Negroes, it creates an opportunity to preserve the Gods of the Laker section. In fact, Adjacent to the Gods of the Lakers section are some of the most prominent Newport residents. Our signer of the Declaration of Independence is right adjacent to the Gods of the Lakers. And then later, as newly arrived immigrants would arrive, they also would be buried there. So we have Greeks and Portuguese and military personnel. So the Gods of the Lakers section was set up initially for some Negroes, but very early on, it becomes integrated. And by the very fact that it's an integrated burying ground, it's probably why it exists today, because it had value to the larger white community. So what I'd like to do is to walk you through some of the markers there. Today, we have restored and retained about 300 markers that run the span of the 18th into the 19th and some very early 20th century. There are still many markers that we're recovering and restoring at that burying ground. Many have just fallen and receded into the earth. And we're using ground penetrating radar and other discovery methods as we're beginning to restore markers and place in their proper location. The challenge that we have is, is that we're working in three and a half centuries of placement and things change. And from footstones to headstones, it's hard sometimes to figure out exactly where things should be and where people should be. But at least I wanna walk you through some of the markers that we have restored and what they say and what they mean today. 
what <coughs> one of the most important markers we have is this marker of Pompey Brenton. Pompey Brenton is one of a number of what we call Negro governors or African governors. This tradition started as early as 1740 to 1745. The Africans in June of that year would come together in their community and they would select their tribal leader. The white community interpreted that as a mimicking of colonial government or colonial governor and they allowed it and the general sense was they didn't quite recognize it for what it really was, which was African organization. These African governor or Negro elections were happening simultaneously, not only in Newport, but in Hartford, Connecticut, in New London, New Hampshire, Massachusetts. They're happening all across where Africans, particularly who are arriving from the Gold Coast, who are bringing with them their language, their culture, their political systems, their religious systems, and their absolute knowledge of political tribal hierarchy. I can't tell you how important this is because these primary secondary documents that document these African governors are some of the first African organizations in the new world. And they're right here in New England. Pompey Brenton is one of a number. There is a London who is a governor in Hartford, Connecticut in 1755. But most importantly, if you look at the burial marker of Pompey Brenton, you'll notice that what we call the soul effigy uh, or the chair, which represents uh, life, uh, everlasting life with Christ or the light of Christ after death. Normally it's carved in the image of an angel and the angel has an image of the person. One of the most unique aspects of Gods of Laker is there are a number of markers that have these soul effigies with African features. I can't tell you how important this is because today it gives us a firm recognition of the fact that Africans were able to reclaim and maintain their Af African identity in their institutions, such as the African Union Society, in their schools, which were called the African School, and in the very markers that have imagery and language that talk not about an enslaved, but talk about someone who was once a valuable and viable African in early America. And this African Union Society, as I said, were very actively involved by 1780, informing their own burial society, raising funds to ensure that every African man, woman, and child, slave or free, would have a proper burial. I can't tell you how extraordinary this was. The white clergy in Newport would write in their diaries about the fact that when there was a African burial, hundreds of Africans would meet in the town center and then march, singing and banging drums and chanting out to the burial area and oversee the burial. Reverend Ezra Stiles, you in Connecticut should know him very well. He was one of the presidents of Yale University, but before that, he is the great leader of the Second Congregational Church in Newport. His diary, which is online, you should read. It's one of the most extraordinary comprehensive assessments from his perspective of early colonial America. He writes consistently his diary about the African population. He baptizes and converts hundreds of them in his own right into his church. But in one instance, he's talking about a Negro burying, and he's talking about how 200 men and 130 women are marching to this burial ground. And lo and behold, they're marching and overseeing the burial of Quash Dunbar. So what is exciting for me as a bit of a history nerd is that I can take primary documents and connect the people back to the physical markers in the history. It's about as integrated as you could possibly be in the history of these African men, women, and children, where they originated from, how they lived, how they worshiped, and eventually where and how they died. And it's important to recognize that these Africans also saw themselves as Africans. In fact, this marker of Tony Taylor, Anthony Taylor, he becomes the president of the African Union Society. As early as 1787, he's organizing return to Africa. This is 30 years, 35 to 40 years before the American Colonization Society. He is already talking about and raising money to return to Africa because in this, in a letter that he sends to his Providence members, he suggests that we are strangers in a strange land. And even though we are free, we are always going to be second-class citizens. And the only way that we can reach full potential as free Africans is to return to our African soil. And a number of the markers that we have of men and women also gives us an opportunity to be to reconstruct their economic life. As I said before, these Africans, when they arrive, 
Many of them are placed into trade skills and have trade capabilities. Many of them are actively involved in the hospitality industry. In fact, we see many of the oyster houses operating not only in New York and Connecticut and Rhode Island and Massachusetts, but across New England are operated by and supported by and served by enslaved and free Africans. This is the burial marker of Phyllis, who is the wife of Peril Bannister. Peril Bannister operates his own oyster house on Bannister's Wharf as an enslaved member of the John Bannister household. Bannister's Wharf today, this is a plug for Newport, is obviously one of the most popular destinations on the waterfront. It's got great restaurants, great seafood. Everyone wants to be on Bannister's Wharf. Very few people realize that one of the earliest, one of the most successful business operators and entrepreneurs in Newport was an enslaved African named Pero. So as we begin to interpret the history of Newport through markers and through educational programs, we're now bringing to life to our visitors and to our residents the lives of not only John Bannister, who bears the name of this wharf, but men and women like Peru and Phyllis, who contributed to building and supporting this industry during the colonial era. And possibly one of my famous, one of the most important markers that we've been spending a tremendous amount of time restoring is Duchess Comino. Duchess arrived here at the age of 14 from the Gold Coast. She arrived and she's enslaved in the William Channing household. William Channing is an attorney general and a man of wealth. His young son, William Ellery Channing, would later grow up to become one of the early founders of the Unitarian faith and a great abolitionist in Boston. Duchess Camino was trained not only as a cook, but with a specialty in pastry. Her capability as a cook in a pastry cook was so well defined, she was sought after and became what today we recognize as a caterer. She was preparing for large civic events, political events across New England. By the time of her adulthood, she was recognized as the pastry queen of Rhode Island. She would actually take portions of money because there were times that enslaved working on Sundays were able to keep a percentage or some money of their work and she would literally save that earnings and purchase the freedom of herself and her children. At the time of her death, she was recognized by William Ellery Channing as one of the most significant, pious African women that he had ever encountered. In fact, gave her credit to his belief in abolition and the universal equality of all men and women through that personal interrelationship that he had with this African woman. So again, Duchess Camino arrives in the work circumstance, a chattel property at the age of 14, a child, but by the time of her adult life and death, she touches everyone around her, making her world a better place. And the markers that we have, as I said, with the case of Pompey Brenton, this soul effigy has an African woman and a child. If you look very careful at the marker, her name is Phyllis. She's a servant of Governor Josias Linden and wife of Zingo Stevens. Phyllis again arrives very young. She's 13 when she arrives. She is a household servant. She converts to Christianity and becomes a member of the Second Congregational Church. But what's most important about her marker, which was carved by her husband, who's an African stone carver, is that the image has herself, at the time of her death, she had given birth to a child named Prince who was stillborn and born, and they're buried together. If you look very carefully at the marker, the child has African features, and the woman is wearing a very traditional African head wrap. So what's important here is, is that this marker, it recognizes the short life and tragic life of a mother in giving birth to a son who dies, but it recognizes them for who they are. And it recognizes them most importantly, of being beyond a servant, but someone's wife and someone's child. And I can't tell you the number of markers that we have in God's Little Laker that provides that level of graphic and heartfelt depiction of African men, women, and children, not chattel property. And I just want to end this section with the fact, because I get asked all the time, my ancestors are here. Um, my ancestors date back to the burying ground um, up to present day. My dad is there and my grandparents are there and going back. So this is more than just a historic restoration project. This is something that every generation of my family have been equally and intimately involved with. In fact, that center picture is me with a sailor hat circa 1967 with my mom and we're bringing flowers because every Memorial Day we bring flowers um, to members, family members, which we still do to this very day. So this story for me is a story of my obligation to not only recognize my African ancestors on a very personal level, but to provide an opportunity for each and every of us to celebrate and recognize our African heritage and ancestry by restoring this burying ground and celebrating this burying ground. 
So let me just walk through quickly recovery, restoration, and celebration, because what is all the work that we're involved in doing this? And let me be clear, this work is a collaboration of so many partners. This property is city owned, and it's been the city of Newport's leadership in forming a historic bearing ground commission that has been doing the yeoman's work in raising funds, and most importantly, working with city staff in providing the highest level of maintenance and restoration of that work. And I, I can't tell you enough how important the city of Newport's role has been. They have partnered with the Rhode Island Historical Society, Newport Historical Society, Rhode Island Black Heritage Society, Preservation Society, and each of these institutions have contributed restoration work, capital work, interpreting work, volunteering work. We exist today and our success today is because of this incredible team of embracing this work of so many disparate partners in government, historic preservation, and general populace of volunteers. As a part of the recovery work, now that we're restoring markers, we've brought in scholars from a number of universities to begin to do the primary secondary research so we can connect the markers with the people in their lives. Marjorie Drew had received her master thesis at Roger Williams University and has done an extensive, we're hoping that she publishes someday in the near future, an extensive thesis where we've now connected burial markers and the people who are buried there with where they lived, where they worked and where they worshiped. And not only in Newport, as they started to move across New England and in some cases into the West Indies. So this recovery work starts with scholarship and the scholarship is being driven by young scholars at universities across New England who have provided a significant amount of work and support that is giving us an ability to write a larger story and a more broader story on behalf of the men and women who are buried at Gods of the Laker. We're also working very carefully in this recovery with a number of institutions in the maritime economy, because what we're finding is, is that, in fact, two books that I absolutely recommend that you pick up and read is Black Jack's African American Seaman in the Age of Sail of historian Jeffrey Bosner. This was one of the earliest works that begins to document the fact that 20 to 30% of the crews of sailing vessels in the 18th and 19th century are Africans enslaved and freed and indigenous people. Jay Cotri in the Notorious Triangle wrote one of the most definitive studies on Rhode Island, which could be transferred and transplanted in any New England community of the slave trade. And again, both of them are finding that a significant number of Africans are plying trades in the maritime industry. We have dozens of markers of Africans who are mariners, sailing as privateers during the colonial era, whaling vessels, merchant ships, some on slaving vessels. And again, by looking very carefully at the maritime trade, we're able to extract records that exist that provide us a much broader picture of who these men and women were and the lives that they lived. In fact, um, Mystic Museum and its archives on sailing in vessels, and certificates of certifications of owners is a wonderful set of archives to be able to reconnect and recover the stories of these Africans and the early story of colonial New England. We've also been working with Brown University and their students in this past summer, again, the challenges with COVID, they are developing an interactive map. You're actually seeing where drones were flying over and we are literally setting up a map and we are plotting every marker, where they exist, how they're oriented in the larger bearing ground. And that will set the stage for us of not only setting up the digital mapping system, but eventually taking advantage of the new technology of digital and virtual and online tours. One of the great challenges we have at Godswell Lake of being a municipal bearing ground is that it's open to the public. And we have signs and we ask people to be careful and pick up after your dogs. But the point is anyone and everyone can have access there. I don't think we want this to become Monticello. I don't think we're looking as a goal to have a million visitors per year. So I think if we can balance personal visits with online exhibits and virtual programming, it gives us an ability to properly manage this very sacred space. And the restoration, um, a shameless shout out because I think so highly of Beyond the Gravestone. They're from Stores, Connecticut. They came in to do the restoration work and I can't tell you how important the contribution they've made to us. They have been working by hand in sitting down and literally by hand assessing and restoring markers, marker by marker. And the work that they're doing is extraordinary because they're working with, in some cases, 300-year-old historic structures made of slate, marble, and granite. And the work that Beyond the Gravestone is doing in conjunction with our historical institutions and our city staff has been extraordinary. 
and it's an ongoing work. We receive public grants, private grants, and I can tell you, and I'm going on a limb, the average cost of restoring a marker could be several thousand dollars. And again, it comes down to the material, the amount of restoration, the amount of recovery, and it's a challenge and it has to be done by hand. It's not something we can mass produce. And having entities like Beyond the Gravestones and other artists have made the difference for all of us in restoring this important place. And finally, the celebration. One of the things that we need to recognize is that this is more than a burying ground and it's not an ending point, it's a starting point. And the fact that we have so much primary secondary information about who they were, where they arrived from, their language, their religion, their culture, we need to provide multiple platforms of telling the story. So we've engaged the Rhode Island Black Storytellers to actually reenact certain men and women of that burying ground. And we've run programs with school systems. We've had artists come in and restore everything down to our historic signage, to other wayfaring signage, to be able to tell the story by using craftsmen and artists in Newport today to reflect the craftsmen and artists in Newport in yesterday. We've had the Newport Art House and run art shows and dance shows within the markers. Uh, again, respectful, but in a way to bring a whole new audience into the community, into this bearing ground to share the information. And then most importantly, in recognizing the African identity and origins, we've had African celebrations and we've had African ceremonies, some solemn in recognizing those who have survived the slave trade and have arrived in Newport, eventually died in Newport, but others celebratory where people can learn the customs of drumming and the customs of music, all tied and all done within this burying ground. So I'm gonna end here with a very short two and a half to three minute uh, musical interlude to introduce you to the children of, of God's Little Acre. As I've said earlier, many of the Africans that would arrive here were children under the age of 13, including my own ancestor, and many African children would die at young ages, either stillborn at birth or during the early part of their life because of their vulnerability of the various diseases that were running through urban seaports like Newport. So, but one of the things I'm gonna do with this short video is, and I want you to watch very carefully because you're not only gonna see the marker, but we've been working with scholars in Ghana and we're gonna connect an actual image of an African child today with that marker. And I hope it gives you a sense that we're not talking about chattel property. We're not talking about a historical figure we're talking about and celebrating someone's beloved daughter or son or grandchild. It was a flesh and blood human being. And that's really the essence of what we're trying to restore and recover and interpret here is the essence of the African person.
So thank you for um, taking this time to learn about 300 years of history in about 45 minutes. I thank you for your patience and I look forward to answering any questions and comments that you might have. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Keith. Um, I'm giving me a moment. I've seen that um, film a couple of times and it gets me every, every time. Um, so we do have a few questions that, that have come in. Um, uh, let's see, Heather has asked a couple. Um, the first is the day names that you, you mentioned at the beginning of your presentation, um, the ones you shared were all men's names. So she's wondering if, if they're gendered and if so, are there female equivalents? Yeah, yes, there are. Um, there are a number, Ajoba, sometimes that becomes phonetically Judah or Joba, uh, Mimba or Mimbo. There are a number of those day names. And again, we see them across uh, not only Newport and the Common Burying Ground and God's Laker, but across New England. One of the things that's interesting about that is, is that when Africans arrived, in many cases, they were given enslaved names, but in other cases, they maintained their African name. When they converted to Christianity, they would take on a Christian name, but once they became free, they would keep their Christian identity and religion and name, but they named their children and grandchildren with day names. So you have this very interesting interconnection and reclamation of African and now new Christian and New England identity. Thank you. Um, her next question is, as a researcher, where do you go to find documents that show apprenticeships and employment? Are these mostly government documents, diaries and letters or something else? Uh, I've been fortunate over the years to be able to work with a number of historical institutions. I mean, from the National Archives to um, being able to have access to historical institutions here in New England. I mean, I think here in New England, we have some of the deepest and richest records. So you start with the owner's records. Um, clearly, the importance of the maritime economy, the importance of many of the leading families, they kept fairly copious notes and records. And unfortunately, enslaved Africans were owned property, they're chattel property. And you find in their account books, all the information you're looking for, down from the feeding of enslaved people, the clothing of them, if there's medical assistance, if they're doing trade work, the purchasing of equipment on their behalf. You also find in New England, a very interesting circumstance. There's a significant amount of leasing out of enslaved Africans and indigenous people. So if you had a group of Africans in Newport who were very adept at boat building, and Bristol, Rhode Island, or New London, Connecticut had a job to build a boat, they would reach out to Newport and say, can you send us some of your tradesmen and skilled people to do this work? And they'd be leased out for a period of time. So the fact is there's significant record trails, um, particularly on ship logs and on account books and business logs in the 18th century, where we could begin to kind of reconnect these African men and women and children in the work that they did. Going forward, as I said earlier, the fact that this first emancipation, these Africans have access to language uh, and organization, they begin to take minutes in their own right. So it's not that much of a challenge to connect the information because much of it is there. To be candid, it's been hiding in plain sight. It takes a whole loop of scholars that have this interest. Um, I've had less of interest in the founding fathers and much more of an interest in the African mothers. So for me, I knew where to go and more importantly, what to look for. The other important piece is we are part of an African diaspora. And what goes on in New London, Connecticut is directly connected with what was going on in Bridgetown, Barbados, or in Accra, Ghana. So one of the things I've been able to do is to work with the National Archives in Barbados, Bahamas, Jamaica, and lo and behold, lots of New England records. So it's these series of breadcrumbs that you follow across the diaspora that starts maybe in Connecticut and then on to the Bahamas but eventually ends back to either London, England, or certainly to the Gold Coast of what is today Ghana. But it's there. It just needs the types of scholars with the interest and passion to look for it and interpret it. Um, I'm gonna to go to someone else's question, but I will come back to, to Heather's third question. Um, so Maggie asks, I'm really intrigued by the headstone stole effigies displaying recognizable African features. Um, and she's wondering if you know of other burial grounds in the US with similar markers. And thanks you for the amazing presentation. That's a great question. I, you know, and, and I've been brought in everywhere and I've not seen it. Uh, unfortunately, slave 
burying grounds are usually placed in areas that have little or no interest of value. Many of them during the late 19th and early 20th century were lost to redevelopment. There are a number of earlier African burying grounds of large scale, much larger than Newport. I mean, you're talking about tens of thousands in New York that were buried in the Lower East Side. You have thousands upon thousands in Boston. You have tens of thousands in Philadelphia that have gone the way of urban redevelopment and, and in some case, vandalism. So everything that we've seen that exists, we've never quite seen this level of unique inscriptions um, and artistry. But again, that's unique to what was going on in New England generally, but particularly Newport at that time. Um, even the markers of the enslaved that are paid for by master and mistress have a little more detail. And it's a paternalistic inscription, but still a little bit more detail in the recognition of a level of humanity. And I, I want to be careful there because, again, people sometimes in New England want to tell me that New England slavery was kinder and gentler as compared to the American South. That's a false narrative. Africans and African Americans thrived and survived despite enslavement because of them seizing the opportunity of the unique religious and economic circumstance. But let me be clear, there are thousands of slaves running away in colonial New England all the time to escape their enslavement. There are brutal punishments that are met out in Connecticut, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and New Hampshire of enslaves. But it's important to recognize that at the very least, it's these Africans themselves that had the ability to be able to have some self-determination in how they should be buried in raising money and pooling their resources to ensure that everyone had a proper burial. And you have masters and mistresses in joining them, particularly those in, it's the religious connection that's important. Remember, New England generally, but particularly Rhode Island is settled under the tenets of religious toleration freedom. The, the men and women that came to New England, they're not French trappers or Spanish conquerors or Portuguese explorers. They are persecuted Christian religious minorities. And Rhode Island particularly, they are very aware of religious persecution. And it's a bit of an irony because the earliest slave traders and slave owners in Rhode Island are Quakers and Sephardic Jews, two of the most persecuted religious minorities of that time. But by the very fact that they do embrace religion, they almost immediately bring enslaved Africans into the religion. We have in Jewish households enslaved Africans with Jewish names, and we have five listed as Israelites. So it's important to recognize this unique interdependence. It's not integration. This unique interdependence across religion and trade and even living arrangements creates a level of person-to-person -person humanity that the Africans would build upon earlier here as compared if you were in a sugar plantation in the West Indies or a rice fields in the Carolinas. In fact, there's an old slave saying called soul down the river, which means better to be a house servant in New England than with the malaria and the mosquitoes and the snakes in a rice plantation in the Carolinas. But nobody wanted to be in a sugar plantation in the West Indies where life expectancy was several years. And if you were a disobedient servant in New England, they sent you south down the river. So I, I hope that answers the question because it's a complicated and it's a complex and system where many things are going on. But what's most important is, is how the Africans were able to take advantage of access to religion, access to cohabitation, access to trade skills, and begin to immediately build when they become free, early self-determination and efficiencies, which would have been largely unheard of until the American Civil War generations later. It's very interesting. And I now want to go and do so much more research. So thank you. Um, that actually leads back to, to Heather's third question. Um, you had mentioned that so many of these burying grounds get lost. Um, and do you have any, any guidance and maybe how they could be found again? Um, I, you know, it, it's, it's a challenge. I've done a lot of work everywhere. Um, the problem or the challenge in the West Indies is many of the burying grounds were in the low watermark around beach areas. And because of erosion and development, they're lost. I mean, I, believe me, I've spent time in the Bahamas searching uh, and in Jamaica searching, and they're lost, uh, quite candidly. And, and not only, I want to be clear, not only enslaved burying grounds, but general colonial burying grounds are lost. 
because again, many of these states and communities may not have the historic district and restoration and preservation controls that we sometimes take for granted, particularly here in the New England part of the United States. In the American South, it's more of a care issue. I, I've spent a lot of time in South Carolina, in Virginia, and there are scores and scores of burying grounds. Antebellum era, not colonial era, but certainly the antebellum area, which need to be restored, recovered, and there's a lot of work going on around that. Um, we believe, and what the National Trust and scholars tell us, is that the Newport section is perhaps the oldest and largest intact existing. And it's interesting for us because I spend a lot of time in New York City. I have ancestors tied to the New York City burying ground, but all they know in New York is that there's a burying ground there and there remains of thousands of Africans. And that was because they stumbled upon it back in 1990, building a federal building. And the work that they've done has been extraordinary. And the recovery work and the historical presentation and the exhibits and presentations in New York City are incredible. But what we have here in Newport is so much more unique. We have the original markers. And now working with scholars and historical institutions, like a Greenwich Historical Society, we're now interpreting the lives before, during, and after death. And I can't tell you how that exciting is and how unique that is in its own right. Um, so our next question, and my apologies um, if I'm not interpreting this correctly, but um, someone is asking, can you talk a little bit more about how um, I guess the Africans that came over, some of the contributions that they brought, um, they mentioned okra, so I'm guessing food and, and other um, maybe cultural sort of um, elements of their lives that they brought with them to. It, it, it's, it's a great question. It's been fascinating for me to be able to read account books and ship logs and, and how certain Africans are being specialty ordered uh, and from where. And one of the things that the Rhode Island merchants did, which is either brilliant or insidious, depending upon your viewpoint, is starting with Samuel and William Vernon, they found out very earlier as merchants that enslaved Africans from Sierra Leone uh, were some of the greatest rice cultivators and farmers that they've ever encountered in the African coast. And they felt that these Africans who were very advanced in rice cultivation would be perfectly suited not to be sent back to Boston or New London or Newport, but to be shipped at a higher value and higher profit to the low countries of the Carolinas. So William and Samuel Vernon are the leading slave traders to Charleston, South Carolina. And they are literally sending Rhode Island ships to Bunce Island off the coast of Sierra Leone capturing and transporting enslaved Sierra Leone Africans, not to Boston, Newport, or London, but directly to Charleston markets to be sold into rice plantations. Today, we recognize them as the Gullah people. And what's, again, either brilliant or insidious is, it's brilliant because they are very focused on a very well-organized understanding of the market and the market demand. It's insidious because Rhode Island merchants are perpetuating the trade and doing by self-selecting certain tribes in certain locations. In the case of Ghana, you have, for the most posts, it's called the Gold Coast at the time. Why? Because the Ashanti, Fanti, the Akan people were some of the finest goldsmiths of their day, even to this very day. Uh, gold was plentiful. They worked with it. They had the ability to, as artisans, to shape it into all different types of commodities from self-ware to pottery to other artifacts. So when it came time to bring Africans to New England, and you were looking for someone that was going to be a cabinet maker or a fine furniture maker or really strongly inclined to hand skills, it's the Gold Coast Africans you would bring. And you see this in the advertisements, you see this in the account books, because these merchants were highly adept in understanding the market and the market demands and the roles that these Africans would play within that. It's insidious because we're talking about human beings but it's a brilliant economic system. And the return in that economic system is some of the earliest and wealthiest families in America are New England based. And they would use this wealth and prosperity to build what is today some of the most important New England academic, corporate and philanthropic institutions that exist to this day, the Brown family of Brown University. And so it's a challenge for me sometimes to be able to sometimes look at this impassionately as a scholar and a researcher. And then 
there are times when I sit and just shake my head saying, they're talking about a 10 year old boy. Um, they're talking about a woman. And that can be challenging sometimes and, and highly emotional. But again, it's my absolute responsibility to interpret history with the validated facts and primary and secondary documents that I uncover. And I leave it to organizations like the Greenwich Historical Society and others to do the real hard work of presenting it to the public and engaging the public. It's both, both important and very difficult work. Yes. Um, we have several more questions. Um, so thank you everyone for, for submitting them. Um, our next question is asking about military members interred at the burial ground on the list. And are they on the list at the Veterans Grave Marker Program? Uh, yes. Um, again, we have Newport has been and continues to be a major armed service with a Navy base and less fort operations. And you will see a number of military people who are buried there. Um, my own uncle, Newport uncle, is buried there. He was a member of the famous Tuskegee Airmen. And he was killed at the age of 20 in service to his country in 1944. And he's buried there with full military. My dad, who served four years in the United States Army in World War II overseas, is buried there. So there are a number of African-American men and some women that represent the American Revolution, the American Civil War, the Spanish-American War, World War I and II, that are also a part of that story. And, and again, one of the challenges that we have is everyone gets excited about the colonial era and we're trying to suggest that we can begin programming and education and learning about 19th century life in colonial Newport in New England in early 20th century, because each and every one of them have their own stories to tell. Those are all a part of the larger stories in stone. Um, we have another question from the same um, participant. Uh, I guess, is the death certificate for the youngest member interred at the burial ground available for public view? And I guess in general, um, I mean, one of my questions would be, are death certificates? No, they're, in colonial era very rarely do have death certificates. You'll have in diaries where the doctor visits and signs off that that person died of this disease or whatever it might be. But uh, very rarely you see death certificates don't become more formalized until the antebellum era. So we're really talking about the 1830s and 40s. Before that, uh, I find mostly either in the records of the African Union Society, because they will have a record of so-and-so died, because what happens is someone dies and then the widow comes and says, all right, he's a member, pay up. We actually have cases where the disputes, I mean, we've had cases where people have died and they've gone to the society and the society says, you know what, they haven't been paying dues for the last two years, so we don't have any money for them. Well, I'm going to sue you. I mean, so there's it's really fascinating discussions and disputes going on that give us a sense of what was going on and how people were being recorded and more, and ultimately how people were being represented in their death. Um, you do have diaries that exist. There are several Africans that wrote diaries or letters that begin talking about uh, members who died and where they were buried and markers that are being, we even have cases where in the John Stevens shop, which is today the oldest continuing operating stonemason shop in Newport. That dates back to 1705. The Benson family now operate it. They have some records where people are ordering markers that go back to the 18th century. And you have masters and mistresses ordering markers for enslaved household servants who died. Or you had African Union Society or free Africans ordering markers on their behalf. But, but again, very rarely have I come across death certificates in the 18th century. Um, because we just didn't have that formalized system at that time. Yes, that also must make it somewhat of a challenge not to have those official documents. For it's a challenge. I mean, it's again, you know, any good researcher is a very good, you know, detective. And you're looking at every and any source that you can come by. The only thing I can tell you today after 30 years of doing this is, is that the old days, you were just traveling to location and spending three and four days in the stacks and in the archives. And I have allergies and I was like taking lots of allergy pills and the dust and the must and such. And you kind of managed through it. Today, we're getting more and more advanced in digitizing collections and making it available online. I'm doing a project in Rhode Island where thank goodness the state archives and our historical societies have been digitizing artifacts for me because we can't physically meet. I can't physically enter their archives. So They've been working and digitizing and transporting it, and that's been a godsend. And I think the more that we're heading in this direction using technology, 
the better access all of us will have to these documents. And then through scanning, we can begin to inspect and review these documents in a much more careful consideration. Um, I, I wanna be clear and honest about this. The greatest change I've seen in African American history is that it has value today. 30 years ago, I could run into two or three people anywhere I went who said, geez, Keith, I'm so excited that you're here because I really care about this. Nobody else on the board or the class cares, but I'm glad that you're here and I'll work with you. Now you have young men and young women that are becoming African-American scholars and are seeing this as a primary leading source of history and interpretation. Uh, when I was going to University of Chicago, I was an intern at the Rhode Island Black Heritage Society and the director said, Keith, I want you to get a degree a master's degree in historic preservation. I said, no, I want to make money and get a degree in economics. I'm sorry. Um, she was kind of right and I was kind of right. But in any case, 30 years ago, there were so few people out there who really cared about and very few scholars who were writing about and researching about African-American history. And, and let me make another point. Slavery is not black history. Black history is how our African heritage ancestors survived and thrived despite slavery. And too often, the slave history tends to supersede the story of the people. And we know more about the slave owners and slave traders than we know about the African men, women, and children. In Rhode Island, we talk more about John Brown and James DeWolf as slave traders, and not enough about the African men and women that survived and thrived despite who they were as slave traders. So I think there's a shift now where people want to know more about the people rather than the institution. And I think there are now a new level of scholars who are willing to do the hard work and do the scholarship and write the stories and provide a whole new level of interpretation and programming. And I'm, I'm excited about that as an old timer. Thank you. Um, we do have a few more questions. Um, Mary Lou asks, how did the lifespan of African children in New England compare to that of children in Africa and what played a role in the death of African-American children? Um, That's hard to say because I've, I've never seen any type of, you know, study to assess that. Um, you have to understand that in the case of West Africa, then into this day, uh, yellow fever, and malaria are serious concerns. Um, in fact, I was struck when I go to Ghana about how serious yellow fever malaria still is. Whereas in my case, I took every pill and every shot and I was probably in better protection than the average Ghanaian person, particularly a person that was poor and living in a waterfront or a village. So obviously the life expectancy is tied to disease. And there are certain diseases that are devastating then and to this very day. In the case of urban seaports, like a New London or a Newport, we have ships coming in each and every day across the known world they're bringing with them, obviously, crew that are infected, um, farm animals that are infected, and the fleas and flies that go with it. So you're seeing in a consistent basis, particularly in the colonial era, significant waves of pandemics. In Newport's case, uh, yellow fever and cholera pandemics are pretty frequent. Um, I'm doing a study right now on indigenous people in New England. And one of the things that I found is before 1620, before the initial settlement at Plymouth, there is a pandemic called the Great Dying. And between about 1615 to 1620, it wiped out nearly 80% of the indigenous people from Maine to Cape Cod. So before there was any large scale European settlement or colonization, it's the few French and English explorers that arrive that bring with them yellow fever and cholera that completely decimate the indigenous population. So. We don't have records at that time to document that, but what primary records, which are diaries and accounts that we have, it is consistent that young people and older people, meaning the average age is probably in their 50s in advanced age, were highly susceptible to these diseases. I hope that answers your question. It's a kind of a roundabout, but again, it's a complex answer. And there's always gaps in what we know and what we should know. And not always, what they called something back then is what we would call it today. Absolutely. Yeah. We have Roger Williams, our, our great founder, uh, who learned a number of the indigenous languages, would actually interpret in his diaries. And he actually writes about uh, pandemics. And they talk about it very specifically that um, I'm swelling. You know, my feet are swelling. My face is swelling. Um, 
I'm, my head is burning up and it's, it's close to yellow fever. It's close to what, you know, we look at and interpret today. So there is some bits and pieces of primary documents that help us understand this. Um, so Lynn Williamson asks, she says, thank you very much um, for your tremendous amount um, and new perspectives on complex history. Do, um, she's wondering if any of the markers reflect indigenous people um, and or intermarriages. That, that's a great question too. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm finishing work with the city of Providence on that. For the most part in New England, there are far and few between interrelational relationships between Africans and white. Um, for the most part during the colonial era, you see a significant interrelationships between indigenous people and African people, largely because of the fact that they're working side by side and they're cohabitating similar spaces. You also have the horrific circumstance of the Pequot Wars of the 1630s in Connecticut that devastate the Pequot people. And the few remaining Pequots that survived those wars were enslaved, many shipped off to the West Indies for life. The remaining indigenous women were not intermarrying with white men, but they are intermarrying with native men, or with African men. By the King Philip Wars of the 1670s in Rhode Island, you have the same circumstance. The surviving indigenous men are sold off to slavery in the West Indies and elsewhere. And then we see the indigenous women intermarrying with African men. So by the antebellum area, by the 1830s and 40s, there are significant numbers of mixed indigenous and African people. In fact, today, uh, and I have that ancestry, I have an uncle who was the New York State Indian Council uh, chief, and I have aunts who were part of Indian councils, and I have others that weren't, they were black. Um, today, if you go to the Cape, many of the Wampanoag people have African heritage. Many of the Pequot people have African heritage. Many of the Narragansetts and Rhode Island have African heritage. We call that creative survival. Um, they did those things based upon the opportunities that were arrived to them. But let me stop and say something very important here. The indigenous tribes who have existed tens of thousands of years before European colonization, before African slaves arrived, they were devastated by pestilence, and by war, and by land taking. But by the end of the 19th century, the one thing that New England governments did, state governments did, particularly in Rhode Island, which was insidious, we didn't set up reservations. We didn't carry them off and send them to the Midwest. We just let them fester in New England. But one of the things that was done in the 19th century is we began stop calling them natives. We started calling them colored or Negro. So we begin to look at the census of 1840 and 50 and 60 and 70. You very rarely see a census marker that identifies a native person. They are colored, they are Negro. They literally wiped them out as a independent sovereign people. And it would take eons and years to regain that sovereignty. And it's a sore point in a very complex history that we still deal with to this very day. Am I native? Am I mixed? Am I African? In fact, I have a number of African heritage friends that have documented native ancestry but they're not recognized of that because of their mixed industry. And then the other issue is who makes that determination? Is that the Department of Interior, the Bureau of Indian Affairs? Is that the state of Connecticut? Who makes that decision? Or is it the people themselves, who's native or not? So again, it's a very complex issue that's tied to indigenous detribalization and tied to African enslavement. But it's all here in New England, all intermixed within the very people and the cultures and identities that still exist to this day. And I'm literally working on a project in Rhode Island to kind of unveil in that history. And it's, it's difficult because I will be candid. We're going to be talking about names of family and people who have indigenous heritage that have not been recognized that way. They knew it, but the communities that they've lived in or the places that they worshiped or the jobs they're employed in did not. And it's, it's been something that's been traumatic that dates back to the very settlement of New England. Well, thank you very much for that work. Um, I look forward to, to seeing where, what you uncover and, and how we can restore that, that history. Um, 
Um, and they won't look at historical records the same again. So thank you. No, and, and I will tell you, Anna, in Connecticut, we're doing some of that work in Bridgeport, the Little Liberia community. I mean, a, a great example of that is some of the early founding members were part of the Pagesit and Pequot and other Mohegan tribes. Some of them intermarried with African-Americans. That created someone like me. I had ancestors there who were listed as native and then colored by 1840. The Pagesit people have petitioned the Bureau of Indian Affairs to be a standalone tribe. It was turned down largely because of the fact is you're not Indian enough, you're more black. The fact that you named your neighborhood Little Liberia gives us a sense that you had more of an African orientation than a native orientation. But again, who's to say that these men and women who celebrate their ancestry as native people, as Pagesits in Connecticut, don't have a right to recognize who they are and claim who they are. So. This is a very complex issue. And for the native tribes in New England, it's a civil rights issue of the 21st century that's still unfolding. Um, we have just a few more questions. Oh, a few more have come in. Um, so I'm not sure we're gonna get to all of these. Um, 302, thank you for, for submitting them. But um, I do wanna be cognizant of, of our speaker's time. He's been very generous going a little over what we anticipated. Um, so the question is, was any research done on those who died due to injuries sustained uh, or occurring on farms? Uh, we find in account books pretty consistently people being injured or dying from injuries and such. Um, I remember recovering one where literally a barrel fell and crushed the skull. I mean, they're pretty descriptive. So yes. Um, there are account books that talk in detail about not only those who might have been injured, but the medical expense, because they have to pay for and account for the medical expense of having a doctor arrive and setting a broken bone, or obviously someone has a disease or an illness. So there are consistent accounts around that and are largely found in account books. Later by the Free African Societies in their minute books, you hear them talking about why someone died or someone was ill, we're going to visit so-and-so because they have taken ill and we're visiting them. Um, I have one marker at the burying ground of a boy. He's just five years old and he dies of yellow fever and he's enslaved in the household of Josias Linden, the royal governor, and royal governor creates a marker for him. But in his father's diary, which still exists, he talks about him tending, he and his wife tending to the poor boy and then writes a whole, he now died this night of the bloody flux and now we're gonna be burying him back in Newport. I mean, it's in the diary. And the marker talks about this young boy and then the diary talks about the very last days of his life and how it impacted his mother and father. Even though they're enslaved, they're a mother and father uh, anguishing about their five-year-old child. Um, so for your next question 302, um, does the Greenwich Historical Society have any info on the Pequot War? Um, and was Thomas Lyon Sr. a soldier in that war? I just encourage you to, to contact our archivist and submit that question, um, Christopher Shields. So if you have any questions relating to Greenwich, um, we're a great resource for that, but you can definitely uh, contact him and send in a research request. Um, I will ask one more question. Um, this is from Teresa, and she's asking about Black Rock Harbor in Bridgeport, um, our Freemans and Belmetas worked there. Um, so I guess if you could talk a little bit about um, Black, Har Black Rock Harbor and Little Liberia and the work that's being done there. Um, I know a little bit more about Little Liberia. My, my ancestors were part of the founding families and, and I know my great, great, great grandfather transferred property to Mary Freeman. Uh, and we have artifacts. I actually own artifacts that they brought from them. And my own grandfather was born there um, in 1876. But uh, the work being done now is pretty extraordinary. Uh, the nonprofit group that's leading that effort have done extraordinary work. There are two remaining houses, the Mary and Eliza Freeman houses that are going through a process of restoration and eventually interpretation. Um, I've been excited because I've been able to come and do presentations and provide kind of a, a personal viewpoint uh, of these men and women and families who had lived there. Um, Little Liberia is a part of a network of free African, in some cases, African indigenous communities that existed all across New England during the late colonial early antebellum era. And what's exciting for me is, is that 
I've been able to work with not only Little Liberia, but also look at records of Africans that operated in communities in the Lower East Side of New York, in Central Park before it was Central Park, in New Haven, Connecticut, uh, in Bristol, Rhode Island, in Newport, in Boston, in Providence, Rhode Island. And lo and behold, these free Africans and African-Americans are all moving between communities. Some of the most important early founders of the African societies in Providence are Connecticut residents who leave Norwich in New London and decide to go to Providence because that's where the action is and they become leading contributors. The same in Newport. Some of our leading citizens of the early 19th century are coming from New Haven and Bridgeport such as my family and others, and they're now working in, in working in Newport and building early black churches and black civic organizations. So for me as a scholar, I see Little Liberia as a part of a one of a number of pearls on a necklace. And working with scholars across communities, we now can tell a much broader story about how each of these communities were very much a part of the early origins of not only those cities, but of people of color. And my fun fact that I love to say on this is, when you think of some of the earliest indigenous and black communities in New England, today they're some of the most prosperous communities. In Boston, the earliest black community is Beacon Hill. In Providence, it's College Hill where Brown University is. In Newport, it's Bellevue Avenue. I own business cards and diaries of black owned businesses before the Civil War on Bellevue Avenue, before the Gilded Age. So I think it's important for us as we do this research and discovery, it helps us understand not only early America or early community, but it also helps us understand the absolute essential contributions that men and women of color made to building our cities and our states and our nation. And I just wanna close with this. This is what our kids of color wanna hear. They see history as power and as identity, and they don't wanna talk anymore about Thomas Jefferson as a slave trader. They get that. They get what these men and women did. They now wanna learn the stories about people that look like them or that worship like them. And they want to identify with them. And I believe that historical institutions by recovering this information is gonna build a whole new sense of identity and power to the future customers and visitors and members of your societies. So I, I think it's a great business move to present and promote this ethnic history because I think it's gonna resonate and it'll be in great demand by the majority of the populations of this country in the near future. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. Um, there's lots of thanks from, from our audience as well, from, from Diane, from Joan, um, from Christine. Um, and I apologize if we did not get to, to your question. I know um, that Keith has generously offered um, you know, to follow up if, if you still would like, like those answers. So thank you again um, so much for, for sharing your work and um, enjoy. No, I'm, I'm happy to support you. And please and share my email and people can feel free to email me and I'll, I'll try to get back to you as soon as I can or, or at least point you in the direction of other scholars or other work. Good night, everyone. Thank you.